my pleasure now to introduce one of my uh, board colleagues, uh, Cara Sein. She is the founder of Your HR Navigator. She's an expert uh, human resources consultant with over 20 years of experience helping company leaders alleviate stress, confusion, so they can make HR work for their business. She's worked with organizations in a variety of industries like manufacturing, engineering, Fortune 500, family business, and private equity. Kara helps business owners, HR professionals, and employees navigate change and make decisions with confidence. Get in touch with Kara today and learn how she can be your guide from the side. Please welcome Kara Sign. Thank you, everyone. I am Kara, and I am now going to introduce our panel for today. We have three great speakers, although you're only going to see two of them in front of you at this purple table. We have one who will be up on the screen, Lori Nicolette, and we'll introduce her as well. So to start, I'm going, to, I'm going to introduce Lisa Talcott. She is a vice president at Assured Partners. She's in her fourth year as an employee benefits advisor at Assured Partners and works with small and mid-sized employers. Um, she also has more than five years of other sales operations benefits experience. And in 2020, Lisa was named one of the top 20 employee benefit advisor rising stars. She serves as an AP CARES champion. Maybe we will have time at the end to ask her what that means. And as a St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce ambassador as well. Thanks, Lisa. She's going to be one of our benefit experts today. And then we also have Dr. Leslie Serbeck, who graduated from the U of M Medical School in 2004 and completed her residency in internal medicine at Hennepin County Medical Center in 2007. After practicing in traditional insurance-based medical care systems for 14 plus years, she stepped away from that, from her position, with one of the large local health organizations to open Evergreen Primary Care. And that opened in October of 2021 with two of her colleagues who are also here that we hopefully can meet later, Dr. Sherry Vane and Dr. Anita McDonald. She and her partners are proud to be part of the direct care movement, offering an alternative option for those looking for truly personal, accessible, and affordable primary health care. So thanks, Dr. Serbeck, for joining us today. Last but not least, and we don't want to forget Lori, who is far away. We don't know where she is in the world right now. She could be anywhere, but Lori Nicolette is a benefit specialist at a employer, Ayers Associates Incorporated, and Lori knew right out of high school that she wanted to help others. She did not know where that was going to take her and tossed around ideas of going into education or healthcare or accounting. And it wasn't until after completion of an accounting degree, for those of you in accounting in the room, um, she in a roundabout way realized she, this was going to lead her to human resources. It did for you, Mike. Um, exactly where she needed to be helping employees figure out the benefit world. Um, she decided that she would know not get the summers off and not deal with the fear of needles and not deal with taxes. So Lori has been working in the benefit world for over 17 years, although in the last five, her company is self-insured. She's in the self-insured world, educating employees how to make good health consumer decisions, and now is introducing the direct primary care model, which Dr. Serbeck and her colleagues are a part of, and we're going to learn more about today. That direct primary care model has been a huge component of the AIRS medical plan, and she's excited and honored to be a part of our presentation today. She's here? She is. Oh, can we see her? I'm, I would like that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and the joys of technology. It all worked a few minutes ago prior to all of you joining us. So hopefully we will see and hear Lori as much as possible because she is the employer representative today to talk about you know how some of these alternative ins insurance or non-insurance models can be effective and help you in the meantime if we can't get her up maybe chad you can go to the next slide and i just want to very momentarily say there are, oh i have Not working? Okay. All right. Well, let me just say we have traditional health insurance. 
jobs, right? And many of you, if you work in an employer, have traditional medical or dental, life, disability, these traditional insurance products. That's what's on the first slide. I have a list of them. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is often small, mid-sized employers, maybe nonprofits. Um, I work with some small schools who really can't afford to offer traditional insurance products because they can range anywhere from four or $500 a month per person to $1,200 a month per person just for medical coverage, and that might not be affordable. So, oh, there's the list. So if we go to the next slide, the next list is just a quick, um, quick summary or list you can kind of refer to of the variety of things we're going to be talking about today. Direct primary care, ICRAs, ICHRAs, you may have heard of. We're going to talk briefly and mention NICE Healthcare or Kavira, another uh, player in the market. Agency bundles, what is that? Something called Fresh Bennies. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on prescription savings for companies like GoodRx. We use the commercials for that all the time. And then something called HealthShare, which was actually new to me. I think it might be interesting to touch upon. Do we have Lori yet? Do you know? Well, she's she's on here, yes. Oh, we I just can't see her. We can't can see we her. Can hear her? Uh, we should be able to. Can she hear us? Hello. Yes, I can hey, hear you. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> oh, good, Lori. You can still weigh in, even if we can't see you. So that would be excellent. I want to start with Lisa first because she, as a broad insurance benefits broker, is in the best position to give us a broad overview of all our different options and. Um, save the in-depth discussion for later, but can you just give us an idea of what um, you've been dealing with with employers and what's available for all of us to discuss today? Sure, thank you. So according to uh, recent employer surveys, 75% uh, of employers in 2023 are looking to expand or enhance benefits, which as you might guess, has to do with a recent current hiring environment, which is very challenging. And as an employer, it's an opportunity to differentiate you know, the experience and culture of working at your organization. And the other 25% are prioritizing cost containment. Of course, everybody's prioritizing cost containment and medical trends for you know, medical costs of services is at about eight to nine percent, which obviously uh, outpace, outpaces inflation. So those are kind of the two categories, like how do we contain the costs and keep uh, the, the most important pieces of what we have and then enhance the benefits to create an improved experience that our employees are going to perceive as uh, you know, an advantage for working with our organization as an employer. Excellent. Thank you. And Leslie, can you give us an overview of something called the direct primary care model? That is your sweet spot in the business you're in now. What is that and why should smaller employers care about that? Yeah, um, thank you. I've, so direct primary care, Um, direct primary care is an alternative model uh, for providing primary care to patients that does not bill insurance. So um, it's kind of an umbrella term, and um, there are a lot of different variations of direct primary care. Um, but it's um, been around now for probably 15 years, um, but it sort of started um, bubbled up from the, the ground up um, uh, and born out of uh, a lot of physicians and patients' frustration with um, the insurance-based system. Um, as it turns out, and I, I'm sure some of you guys probably have experienced this, you may be paying a lot for insurance, um, but that doesn't always translate into um, getting easy, um, easily accessible, personal, um, quality, comprehensive primary care, like if you remember a long time ago, like having your family physician who knows you, who can see you when you're actually sick, um, who um, 
that you have a relationship with. So even though your pain, the people have been paying a lot, uh, they're paying more and more over time, it seems like they've been getting less and less for primary care. And it turns out, um, you know, a lot of people uh, have called direct primary care innovative, but it's, in my mind, it's sort of old fashioned because um, it's sort of um, getting back to the, the basics and the um, uh, simple system of removing um, a lot of the middlemen and just um, having patients contract directly with their care providers. Um, and so it changes a lot of the incentives um, that uh, providers and, um, and patients have. And, and I think there's, uh, we could get into like the details of that. Um, so um, in a nutshell, it's uh, primary care kind of carved out um, of the insurance system and uh, a recognition that primary care is uh, very, um, maybe a very different thing than emergency care, um, specialist care, surgery, that can be a little different and can be paid for it. And we definitely will get into more details about that. Um, Lori, from an employer perspective, I can see you a little bit now. And I think yeah. yes. Can you talk about why did your employer choose to go with a DPC model and what else you offer in addition to that? Sure. Um, so we are an employee-owned company. We're headquartered out of Eau Claire, Wisconsin, but we've got offices all over the United States. And we were looking for ways to support our employees and their dependents to have great have a great healthcare experience, along with financially reducing their spend. As as you know, healthcare costs have been on the rise for some time, and we were hearing that from them as well. They couldn't get enough money into their health savings accounts to cover future medical expenses because they were spending it as quickly as they were putting it in there. So back in uh, 2017, we decided to do a trial run with direct primary care here in Eau Claire. Uh, we had decided we'd pay the monthly memberships on behalf of our employees and their dependents, feeling so strongly that even though it was gonna cost us money, it would reduce our medical spend. We soon found out that it was exactly what our employees were looking for. After just a year, our feedback was astounding. People were not having to deal with medical billing issues because there simply weren't any bills for them um, for their medical care. They had money to spend on anything if they did have something catastrophic come up because now they were saving money on all of their uh, acute and chronic conditions. And they were no longer waiting for days and weeks for appointments. They had a physician that cared about them and spent the time that they needed to get their questions answered. Um, and I would say one last thing about that was um, when I hear from a random employee that says, thank you, had I not signed up for this model of healthcare, I went in for a physical, I knew it wasn't gonna cost anything. I was, diagnosed with a life-threatening issue that wouldn't have gone detected otherwise. And so basically preventing a devastating situation for the employee, but um, could have been a very devastating medical claim for the company um, in future years had it not been detected. So it's been a great decision for us um, and our employees are very happy with it as well. I should probably clarify a little if you're not at all familiar with direct primary care, it's a subscription model. Right, so you, the employer or an individual can go to Evergreen or other primary care providers and say, I'm gonna pay for your subscription fee once a month. It ranges from 30 to $80 and show you some of those costs in a few minutes. It can be an add-on that an employer wants to put on top of or in addition to your current offerings in order to get people like Lori was just saying to the clinic. Because what's happened, what we've done inadvertently is with all these high deductible health plans, we've made it so expensive, even though we may think this is a preventive visit, if I go in and I'm diagnosed with something serious, all the tests start happening, right? Now that diagnosis code isn't just a preventive visit and I'm going to be paying out of pocket because I'm on a high deductible plan. Many people are afraid to do that. I, I'm going to not go because I might have to spend a thousand dollars. And that is really making our population overall more sick, less healthy, 
and it, it drives up all the behind the scenes at the end of the day the employer costs and premiums and that is why in, insurance rates continue one reason of many <laughs> those of you who are insurance people know um, rates continue to, to skyrocket um, it's also an amazing benefit if you're not able to afford and offer any benefits it is something an employer a small employer or a nonprofit can offer that stands out that says we care about you please go get your basic primary health care taken care of and roughly 80% of everyone's health care spend is or should be just lost the break. <laughs> I don't know if the battery died, but hopefully you can hear me because I've been talking loud. Um, about 80% of us spend $1,000 or less typically in our health care, which is the primary care kinds of services we need. So a subscription model like this is actually very affordable. It is not insurance, right? It doesn't, as I put in the red box, you still may need some catastrophic coverage we get hit by lightning or that infinite hit mm -hmm. by the bus scenario. But these again are alternatives and are options. I don't know if Lori can hear me now, but I'm not on a mic, but I'm, I'm sure she would agree with that. Um, Chad, if you can go to the next slide. I'd actually now like to ask each of our presenters to comment on the pros and the cons of these various models. And we will get into a little more detail on what was fresh bags, what are these other things, these different talks and some of those specifics. Um, this is just a short list, which was probably covered up, but we'll get to that in a minute. Lisa, do you want to start by talking about what are some of the pros and cons from a broker perspective of these alternative benefits um, as you see it? Yeah, so the pros are that you can, as far as budget constraints, it's better to offer something than nothing. The last thing a uh, prospective employee wants to hear is we don't offer benefits. And so by, uh, by looking into some of these lower cost options that are not uh, insurance, you can, you can say we offer these benefits and then define those accordingly. And uh, you know, say that it's an employer paid cost legitimately. Uh, I would say the cons of some of these alternatives and the really important piece to check on is uh, the compliance around it. So many of these alternatives are not insurance. So it's, it's important to understand, is this insurance? Is this not insurance? What does that mean to me? And where do I fit in terms of uh, regulations? If I am an employer with 50 or more eligible employees, the IRS considers me an applicable large employer. And therefore, I am required to offer uh, uh, medical coverage to 95% of my population or take the option to pay uh, one or two penalties, uh, which uh, involve one is whether a, med a medical insurance plan is offered to employees, and then two, does it meet affordability calculations? And for 2023, that calculation is based on 9.16% of household income. So it gets technical really quickly, and so that's where it's helpful to you know, get uh, some, you know proper advice on that. Am I, you know, am I an applicable large employer? Because then there are these requirements. And if I'm under 50 employees, I have a little breathing room from a compliance standpoint. But we know what this hiring market is like, and what do we want to be able to say to that, you know, prospective employee when they're sitting across from the table? What what's going to be impactful for my best chances of building my workforce. Great. Leslie, what are some of the pros and cons of what you're doing with the DPC model? Thank you. This works. Um, well, I can tell you there are a lot of pros for physicians, so I won't go into that. It's, it's been just um, an amazing um, and refreshing way to practice. But for patients and potentially for Employers, I, I, I think um, some of the pros um, involve the change in incentives. Um, so, um, 
if uh, uh, you're paying a monthly fee, say for, um, in our case, um, um, say you're above 40, so that's $80 a month. If you're paying that, it's transparent, it's, um, you know exactly how much you're gonna budget, and you know um, that you can go and get care and time. Um, there's no limit on visits, there's no limit on conversation, on communication, on all of that. What's kind of, just very briefly, what's included in that care? Yeah, so 80, for above 40, um, or age above 40, uh, $80 a month for us um, includes, you know, any visits that you would want to have with primary care um, provider. So you, you do, um, a patient will kind of uh, select their um, uh, primary provider and then, um, you know, uh, for annual physical, um, any kind of, um, you know, acute issue, um, uh, labs, labs yep, yep. Um, so we do um, yearly uh, preventative labs, we have a um, panel of like five different labs that come with that cost, um, but then the, um, the amazing thing is that you also get um, access to our wholesale lab prices, which is just, I mean, my Blowing, actually, as a physician, I, it's, I've spent years um, not really knowing how much labs cost, and um, you know, different patients would say, you know, for a, a basic thyroid test, some patients would be end up, end up paying, um, you know, a forty dollar copay, or some without insurance would pay a hundred dollars for it. And in fact, we get it for four dollars. So, um, you know, and we pay four dollars. Yeah, case you couldn't hear that. And yep. they pass that to their patients. We do. And um, we, you know, so that's a value there. Um, so, for instance, um, just an, a, an example, um, we had a patient that, um, that from our employer that had a, an issue um, that uh, came to see us and required a specialist um, referral. And they used, um, AIRS has like a, an app that sort of helps them pick what specialist um, and um, they, I help them navigate that. Like, yes, I've heard of this clinic. This is reputable. This is good. You know, go see them. And then that specialist, I could coordinate with them. Um, they said, well, these are the labs we want. And instead of having them get the labs there, which would have been hundreds of dollars, we did it for sixty. And so it's just, it's just mind blowing to me <laughs> that um, we can do that. And it turns out that primary care. Um, the routine basic primary care isn't all that expensive uh, when you come down to it. Um, so back to your question. So eighty dollars a month, um, unlimited visits. Um, you can text us in a HIPAA um, compliant um, app. So I have, I do a lot of advising over the phone. Uh, we have telehealth. So we're essentially an urgent care for our members, but we're also the primary care. We do the preventative. Um, here as well. Really quick, can you just touch on the network in clinic locations? So for example, your clinic, Evergreen Primary Care is in St. Paul, in the Midway. And so if I were to sign up and use the subscription model, I would go to your clinic and call you as if you're my doctor. But what if I have employees who live all around the state or in other places? What happens? Yeah, so that is a pro and a con to some extent. It is. Um, so the direct primary care movement um, that is physician-led is very grassroots. So it's a lot of individual physicians and individual clinics. Um, but we are, there are starting to be networks um, where an employer can um, contract with um, um, the big one that we're sort of um, working with right now. It's called Hint Connect. And you can contract with them, and then they they have hundreds of DPC um, practices all over the country, and they will um, figure out where your employees are, um, who they can ha have for their primary care. Um, that, I think, is, is going to be um, really um, an opportunity to really grow um, and make this a little bit more scalable. Lori, are you still there? You can hear us. I am here. Can you come in as, as an employer with people all around the country? You know, yeah. how did that the network or the 
clinical location question come into play when you implemented this model? Sure. Yeah, so we have uh, DPC model clinics in every office location from California to Florida and up through Wisconsin, Minnesota, Colorado. Um, we used uh, a company similar to what Leslie is talking about um, to help with our outlying states. So we contract with them and then they help find the clinics that are a part of that to help facilitate care for our employees there. Um, here in Wisconsin, it's it's not as hard because there's just more more available um, clinics for people to go to. But what happens is, you know, if we contract with Leslie as we have it set up today, they can't go to South Dakota and get that same care from them in person, so to speak. They'd have to go to the clinic in Minnesota unless they did a telehealth kind of situation. So. There is some limitations that way if you need the face-to-face -face and there's just one clinic that you're affiliated with. But I would say that's okay. not a limitation. That would that would be something definitely can be worked through if if indeed that needed to be the case. And, and I recently read an article explaining how more and more doctors are jumping on this model. So there's more and more clinics available across the country and it continues to grow. Now, not to just focus on DPC, but I mentioned earlier on the list, there's Nice Healthcare and Calvera. Those are local um, offerings in this market. Again, an alternative to providing insurance. They are kind of concierge care that comes into your home or your business. They'll start with telehealth or online kinds of assistance. And then if they need to have an in-person visit, they'll come to your home or come to your your parking lot or your business to meet you there if that's convenient. It provides a lot of convenience for people, so it's a nice add-on to insurance. It's also a great program if you don't even offer any insurance. And I have one small employer I've worked with directly to provide nice health care to their five employees. They're really small. They don't have any insurance. But again, a lot of times these um, primary care kinds of services provide about roughly 80% of what most people of the time, including discounts um, on their labs, on prescription medicine, and they can provide a lot or a little bit of everything you need. So it's just added to the list. Let's go to their website so you can check out if that seems to be a good fit for your organization. Um, um, Lisa, can you talk a little bit about what is an ICRA? We had that on our earlier list and some of the pros and cons and why would we consider a individual coverage health reimbursement arrangement? Excellent. Individual coverage health reimbursement arrangement. These were not uh, allowed until 2020. So these are relatively new. A lot of employers, I don't have the whole historical timeline, but we go way back. It, there was a time when employers could just say, here's $200, go get your health insurance. And that is kind of what it is, uh, but it's regulated. So the employer gives a defined contribution. And uh, in this example, you know, $200. And then it's allocated for the employee to go and purchase an individual plan in the individual market in the state of their residence, because that's how the individual market works. So if you have employees in multiple states, there's you know, some analysis that goes into you know, the competitiveness of any given individual market in any given state is dependent on how many carriers participate in that market? How, you know, are the rates higher or lower? What's the cost of care in those areas? There could be a lot of variability. And all of the individual plans are age banded. Younger people have lower premiums, older people have higher premiums. So we already know this. Um, but what it does for the employer is instead of doing a defined benefit where the employer picks a group medical plan, and then the employee, and then you pick your employer contribution, and then the employee decides, you know, is am I I'm going to either do the payroll deduction and take this plan, I may add my spouse or my family, or I may go on my spouse's plan and not even take this. It's an opt-in, opt-out. With the um, individual coverage, the employee can go and allocate, you know, toward, to pick their plan. And then it is also compliant. So it satisfies that applicable large employer um, 
Uh, yeah, Affordable Care Act reg regulation. So it is compliant, but instead of a defined benefit, it's a defined contribution. And so when, when I, as the employee, get my employer uh, contribution for ICRA, then I can go and I can pick from any of the carriers, and I can pick from any of the plans within those carriers and any of the networks. So there's a lot more choice. There's a lot more um, variability, and uh, the, the tricky part is for the employer, there's a lot of analysis up front to do the affordability calculation. I just got out of a call this morning with NextBen about affordability calculations. Uh, and the client has 250 employees making less than $15 an hour. They have to they're an applicable large employer. They have to offer medical insurance. And instead of a defined benefit, they're doing a defined contribution. So we have to do the math on what their contribution is to make it qualify. Well, a lot of those employees are going to be eligible for subsidies on the exchange because of their income. And so one of the challenges with this ICRA has been, it's only been off exchange. It doesn't like if you if you qualify for a subsidy, you just have to go get your own insurance. Period. Well, NextBen, and that's we did put some of these flyers on the tables. NextBen, like literally this morning, just got the call, and they have included on exchange options. Now you can't double dip, meaning you can't use your employer subsidy and the government subsidy you get one or the other either you qualify for the government subsidy and you know you enroll that way but then with with the, with the company administrator like next there's there are several but uh they will allow you as the employer to administer that and take the payroll deductions for the employee responsibility piece of it so that the employee perception is that they're getting their health insurance through you the employer instead of just kind of shunting them off and saying, you gotta go get your own because of your income level. Lisa, let me so. interrupt you. Next then, so one of the pros or cons, and I'm thinking how you look at it, of doing ICRA, is if you do that, you're going to need an administrator, a third party, who, if I say I'm gonna give $200 a month to my employees, I send that to, to a company like Nextbend, it's one example here, um, and then they're kind of, taking care of that for you. And then they work with the employees directly to help them get set up on their benefits, make sure they get set up and use that money appropriately. They may not spend the full 200, great. Or they may spend more than 200 and they may make the difference. So there is an, an extra admin fee because you would need to hire this third party to help potentially in just administering. It's still affordable. The one pro to this kind of a model is the, the expenses are fixed. And they're not super variable. Will they fluctuate 30% next year because my renewal is bad? You know, nope, it's $200, and maybe next year I decide it's $225 or $300, or I go back down to $200 if I can't afford it in a certain year as a smaller employer. So I think those are some of the real big pros to um, the IFRS, as though it takes some analysis. So there's a little con up front, but there's some pros to it long term, too. Um, there's also, um, I want to jump over to Lori for just a minute and then kind of start to wrap a few things up. But Lori, are there other benefits you offer besides this DPC model to your employees that are important to know about? Do you have other alternatives for them? Yeah, we have a, a regular medical, dental, vision insurance plan that they um, have access to. So we have the same robust um, benefit package most employers do. I think that something that's important to, to say is that, you know, through our DPC model with Evergreen and Leslie, is that we require our employees kind of getting a little commitment from them to have an annual physical every year. And I think this is this is where it kind of gets um, like the oh wow kind of factor, right? Is that 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 annual physical at Evergreen typically will cost us maybe 10 to $35 for some routine labs. Otherwise, there's no additional cost to the employer. I just did a, a recent, some recent research on our medical claims within the company and found the average claim for someone going into a system 
for that same exact physical and labs, and it averaged about $800 a person. So doing that statistically for us as a company, employees and spouses, if we did it, if we ran all of those through that DPC model, it saves us over a quarter million dollars annually. That's really critical, I think, for a lot of small employers. That, that's a lot of money. And you might find it hard like to find, like for me to tell you what our actual savings is for acute and chronic conditions, I think it's in the statistics itself and the testimonials that we hear from our employees. Uh, our emergency room visits and costs have gone down over 50% which is huge nowadays. I mean, so you can, we, can, we can see that it's working by using this model. Um, and if there was a con, I would say the fact that there aren't more of you out there is, you know, the accessibility is really um, the only thing that I would say is not working well with, with this kind of model. Well, Lori, that's a perfect segue. Don't quite move forward, but the next slide is gonna be about costs and kind of- okay. From that perspective, I just want to touch on because we haven't talked about what are these other flyers on your table. Lisa provided some additional flyers about fresh pennies um, and this what we would call an agency bundle. So again, for really small employers who can't afford to offer big packages, this agency bundle is something that Assured Partners put together. They created this bundle of at least some basic life and disability types of coverage they're not huge, but they're something. And you can see on there, along with vision, it's very affordable. And the small employer can pick and choose what to offer from this bundle or offer the whole bundle for, you know, roughly about 30 bucks a month or less. So I did want to always point that out if that's on your table. If you have questions about something like that, talk to your brokers, talk to your insurance agents. Maybe they offer these types of things or ask more questions for Lisa later. And then fresh pennies, Lisa, a piece of um, all consumers becoming good users and consumers of healthcare is, is knowledge and advocacy. And I think that's what Fresh Pennies gives. Can you just read for one minute, talk about what Fresh Pennies does and then we're gonna jump into costs. So Fresh Pennies is not insurance, but it complements whatever insurance plan you have or don't have. And this is along those lines of the everyday doctoring accessibility, um, not including anything in person. Uh, during uh, COVID, we've gotten a lot more used to telemedicine. 75% of acute illnesses can be diagnosed over the phone. I personally have used Fresh Pennies for the last 10 years. I have done a video call, email, chat, all different manners uh, at all different times of day. So I've been able to do my everyday doctoring with a board certified physician. Uh, in the category I would call virtual urgent care. You know, so if I had um, direct primary care, I would probably, you know, start there. And for all other, you know, pediatric issues, that two in the morning, or what, like, do I need to go to the emergency room? Are we getting everybody in the car or not? You know, like I call Fresh Benny's first, and then they say, yes, go. And then I know it's worth the time. Or they say, no, do this tomorrow. And so that, that alone is advocacy. So there's other components in here. There's things like this that are subscription packages that have all sorts of ways to make you a better consumer and better arm you with pricing transparency, shopping, discounts on the prescription medication. It's a whole separate topic. And uh, But it's another piece, again, something an employer could offer. They don't have insurance, but they could offer their employees fresh pennies for 10 bucks a month. A few add-ons if they wanted a few additional um, options. So the next slide talks about costs to consider because we've mentioned there are monthly cost subscription fees if you want this DPC model or if you wanted a nice healthcare concierge model that comes to you. Um, and they range anywhere from $30 a month per person to $80 a month. It's age-based. The nice healthcare and Kavira models are in the roughly 30 to 35, maybe on the increasing next year, we'll see a dollar a month um, section. And then admin fees, as I touched on already, you've got to keep in mind with a few of these types of alternative programs, we're going to save money. We're not buying full-on insurance, but we're going to have a few admin fees. And one thing to consider is year-over-year -year variability that you get with insurance and renewals versus regular subscription costs. Fees that are set, that are planned, that are budgetable, 
you know, instead of guessing what your costs might go up to next year, typically we're going to know or you can call your vendors and ask them if they're going to be having any price increases. And just super quick, um, there was one case study I happened to read about recently that in 2019, um, it's actually the DeSoto Memorial Hospital Medical Center, which is in rural Florida, they implemented uh, these alternative kinds of models and saved 24-20 per person, not per person per employee, per beneficiary. So the spouses, the children, per person. So when Lori was talking about is it a quarter million dollars, you could say if everyone went and got that physical compared to a regular um, insurance-based physical, the savings are there. The question is, is, do these models fit for you? Are there accessible clinics for you? And those clinics continue to grow. By the way, I've learned in talking to people in northern rural Minnesota that there are a lot of employers starting to offer these types of alternative models. And in rural areas, more clinics are banding together and working together to provide this kind of care, um, and they like this model. So don't think just because you have a bunch of out-state employees, this won't work for you, because I'm actually, in my own little research, and talking to clients, finding that it's working really well in Northern Minnesota. Um, just before we wrap up and take questions, um, if you could jump to the last slide, Chad, so we have everyone's contact information. But is there any last thought, Lori, you would say to everyone about offering these alternatives? I would just mention to people that if you have any interest in going the DPC model, there's a, a website. It's called mapper.dpcfrontier.com. And on that website, it will list out any and all DPC clinics throughout the United States. That's actually how I found Leslie and her team. Um, so if that's something of interest to you if you don't want to go, I mean, if you're not in the, the uh, Evergreen area location, um, look at that website. It's It's been fantastic and um, it's been a very great move for us. Thank you, that's a great reference. We also have people's names. We have Lisa here, Benjamin John with SimparaHR.com. I talked with him recently session and he is a huge proponent of alternative insurance options. He's a, another um, resource or a person you can call. Please call your own insurance agents, ask them these types of questions. What else is available for us? How can we save money and how can we add value to our employees, especially small employer? Obviously you can ask Leslie or any of her colleagues questions and we wanted you to know there's a podcast coming out. I know it's a little hard to read on Sunday, this coming Sunday that Leslie did with another organization. Oh, my partners too. And yes. the partners, so everyone was involved. Yes. That's coming out on Sunday. And I know it's covered on the screen, but I've sent that information to Chad. So when you get the email recapping the today's session, that information will be there if you want to hear more or learn more about at least that model. And obviously you can always ask your HR consultants who has some benefits knowledge about any of these types of topics. But I'd really love some questions. What questions do you have? And if you don't have questions, is this doable, or do you think these are things you actually are going to look into? The prescription drug costs, how does it work in one of these alternatives? So there can be um, a good RX, you can provide programs like that to employees, or through the DPC model, we can talk about that. Yeah, so, um, First of all, we, I mean, we can send prescriptions anywhere to any pharmacy and people can, um, they have, um, you know, a lot of our patients also have like a high deductible um, plan with some drug coverage, right? So sometimes, um, you know, that's the majority of what they're doing. But um, as you know, sometimes um, insurance um, doesn't cover or even with insurance, the copay is still quite high. And so then, um, we can look at, and we can help navigate that. We can look at other um, um, alternative um, ways to get it for, for cheaper. So GoodRx, or there's there's other programs. Um, um, there are some independent pharmacy um, management or PMB, PBM, sorry, I don't know if it's confused, but um, the PBMs, which are kind of the um, 
say that evil players and yes. the whole thing. Um, <laughs> there's there, there's kind of a, a monopoly of PBMs out there, but there are some independent PBMs. Um, GoodRx is not a PBM, but there's some other alternative PBMs that you can go through. Um, or, um, and this is kind of exciting, um, there are a lot of DPC practices that are dispensing meds. Um, so ordering them wholesale and providing them to, um, to the patients um, pretty much at cost. And um, we are just barely putting our feet in, into that pool. Hopefully we'll be growing that. Um, but um, it's, again, mind-blowing how cheaply um, you can get some uh, medications. Great question. Other questions? Gosh, my goodness, lots of hands. What supplement insurance these people put on throughout the primary care event of COVID-19? Yes, the catastrophic coverage I call it, but Lisa or Ford does it more. What should we add on? If we go in a DPC model, what else does someone need? I'll just say, I, I think if we pair very well with like a high deductible plan, uh, because we, um, uh, people can actually save some money doing that because we're going to provide um, a lot of the routine care, but then they have that catastrophic coverage for something that happens um, unexpectedly or a cancer diagnosis or whatnot. But you may have some other ideas too. Yeah, when you have the high deductible health plan, the employee is responsible for everything out of pocket up to the deductible amount. And so that direct primary care diverts all of those costs and makes it more consistent, right? And then um, same thing with like the fresh bennies, any sort of telemedicine is going to divert those costs away from the plan because it doesn't talk to the plan. Um, and then likewise with the prescription medication, if you're on a high deductible health plan, you're out of pocket. So if you have a, you know, $200 a month prescription, you know, that, that, that could be a big chunk. Um, so working with these, you know, pharmacy benefit managers, 80% are controlled by three players in the market. And so there's a lot of things you see in the news about that, legislation that's pending around that. Um, but things like the GoodRx um, website, which is free, open to the public, Intelligence Rx, you know, these have the intelligence Rx was designed by a pharmacist because he kept getting questions about how the heck am I going to pay for my prescription. Okay, so in the interest of time, yes. please come and talk to Lisa more. I also want to mention HealthShare, which is something I learned about in getting prepared for this. And that's a bolt on where there are these nonprofit entities that employers can do a defined contribution to, um, and that can it's not insurance, but there's a way that that can pay an employee for those high deductibles or for those catastrophic kinds of things up to a limit. It, it has limits on it, but health share programs would be something you could ask the brokers about or go people and learn more about as well. And one more quick question, Mr. Tony, did you have a question? Or yeah. then we'll wrap up. One question related to talking about the drug plan funding or something like How much can the employer contribute? As much as they want? Yes, there's no as, as much as you want. And like I said, they're age banded. So there is a calculation if you have you know a bunch of 20 year olds and then a bunch of 50 year olds, you're gonna um, need to do some calculations to kind of create some equity for the defined contribution amount, but you know that's all part of the analysis. So there's no maximum you can contribute. You do get into the um, Section 125 um, pre-tax rules uh, so that you make sure that those employer dollars are allocated for qualified benefits. So if there's a surplus after they've purchased their medical policy, maybe they can also purchase a voluntary dental or a voluntary vision or other um, ancillary line of coverage with those pre-tax dollars. I hope we got you thinking about all these and you know that you have more questions you're going to want to ask your agents or anyone up here who can stay for a few minutes. 
Um, Chad, do you want to hand out? Oh, Tony's going to hand out. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we do have some gifts for our panelists from Deneen Pottery, one of our members, a great chamber mug. Thank you. Lori, we'll give yours to you. Um, Thank you. Let's see. Coming events, I just want to remind everyone again that uh, Chad also mentioned this at the beginning, but we have David Schultz at our next meeting, November 16th. Mark that on your calendars at the one of my favorite venues for Midway Chamber events, the Minnesota State Fairgrounds Physical Heritage Center. Um, I also just want to plug the Chamber Connect uh, meetings that we're having, which is our uh, effort to uh, welcome new Chamber members to our uh, community. That uh, next one is at Naughty Creek on November 10th. And we've also started a copy club that meets uh, about once a month. And our next one is at Piccola, am I pronouncing that right? Uh, on November 17th. And that's all we have for you today. Thank you. Thank you.